born from salt water. The fluid of the womb with salt levels close to that of the sea nourishes and protects each growing child. In a similar way, Great Salt Lake, another body of salt water, nourishes and protects us in unexpected ways. It protects the very air we breathe, the water we drink, and the food we eat. The lake protects our lungs from toxic dust. It helps fuel the water cycle, adding as much as 10% to the snowpack. Touch a soda can, and you touch magnesium from the lake. Eat a farmed shrimp anywhere in the world, and there's a good chance it fed on brine shrimp harvested from the lake. The lake sustains more than 10 million migratory birds who stop there to refuel on flights to places as far away as Siberia and Patagonia. But the lake does something more that few recognize. It helps build community. Native peoples lived in harmony with the lake for more than 12,000 years, camping and foraging for food along its shores. Pioneer settlers later made it part of their community too. At one point, Saltaire Resort featured the world's largest dance floor. In more recent years, the lake has become a focal point for different groups to come together to try to save it. Make no mistake, the lake and all it protects face a bleak and uncertain future. Around the world, many terminal lakes or lakes without an outlet are dead or dying. Humans take water from the rivers that feed them. Deprived of their lifeblood, they shrink or vanish altogether. In the case of the Aral Sea, the Soviet Union took its waters to grow cotton. At the time, the Aral was one of the largest lakes in the world, larger, in fact, than Utah's historic Lake Bonneville. In just a few decades, however, it shrank by more than 90%, creating a new desert the size of West Virginia. The sea, which once teemed with life, became a place of death as desert winds picked up dust, salt, and pollutants and spread them over neighboring farms and villages. Today, the area sees some of the highest rates of infant mortality, respiratory illness, and premature death in the world. The UN Development Program called the loss of the Errol the most staggering environmental disaster of the 20th century. A similar story played out on a smaller scale in California when Los Angeles took the water that fed Owens Lake to fuel LA's own growth. In less than 10 years, what had been a vibrant lake system became a dry alkali flat and the single largest source of dust pollution in all of North America. To date, Los Angeles has invested more than two and a half billion dollars not to bring the lake back, but just to try and keep the dust down. And that's for a lake just a fraction of the size of Great Salt Lake. Could this be our future? Unfortunately, yes. Errol and Owens both happened in our lifetimes. The same forces at work there are at work here. Worse yet, no terminal lake of any size that's gone down this path has been saved, not one. Despite a couple of good water years here in Utah that have helped us avert disaster, long-term trends at Great Salt Lake remain alarming. Unless we do something drastic, those trends will only accelerate in the face of Utah's continued rapid growth and warming climate, a couple of good winters 
can't make up for the 11 feet of lake declines that scientists attribute to human causes. Where did all the water go? Well, it went to us, all of us, to grow the crops we eat, to sustain our homes and businesses. Far, far too much of it goes to keep literally hundreds of thousands of acres of lawn green here in one of the driest states in the nation. What can be done in the face of such overwhelming challenge? Is there any hope to save Great Salt Lake? Fortunately, yes, but what it requires isn't easy. We must fundamentally redefine our relationship to water. Consider this example from my own neighborhood. For years, there's been an unwritten rule, thou shalt not allow brown spots on the lawn. <laughs> In the summer of 2021, as Great Salt Lake approached record low levels, our family decided to take a different tack. Despite record heat, we determined to water just one time per week. Soon, and in clear violation of the unwritten rule, large brown spots began to appear. My 11-year-old colored a hand-lettered sign and stuck it in the middle of our front yard. It read, Drought Proud. <laughs> a few days later, a neighbor of mine with a beautiful green lawn approached me. I water strictly according to the guidelines, he explained, and managed to keep my lawn green only through careful maintenance and hand watering. Can I get a drought proud sign too? Sure, I replied. Of course you can. The point of this story is twofold. First, we need to meet people where they're at, not where we want or even hope them to be. That means giving credit to anyone who takes steps to help the lake, no matter how small. Second, social expectations can change quickly. In our neighborhood, in just one summer, people started to feel sheepish about lawns that were too green. That's a big shift. <laughs> what else can we do? First, tear out all non-functional turf. If the only reason we step on a piece of grass is to mow it, that's a luxury we can't afford. <laughs> Not if we're serious about saving the lake. I'm happy to report that my neighbor from the previous story, along with others in the neighborhood, have since ripped the grass from our park strips. At our home, we've gone on to remove more than 1,000 square feet of grass, saving some 30,000 gallons of water each year in the process. The second thing we can do is to water the grass that we do use less. Watering even one time less per week won't kill the grass, but it will save thousands of gallons over the course of a single season. Third, use drip lines as much as possible because they use so much less water than traditional sprinklers. For similar reasons, four, switch to drought tolerant, preferably native plants. And fifth, turn on those sprinklers only at night when so much less water is lost to evaporation. And what if we don't have a lawn? Well, we can encourage institutions that use a lot of water, like businesses, churches, and schools, to take these same steps. In short, everyone has a role to play. Together, we created this problem. Together, we can fix it. And what about farmers? who still account for much of the water taken from natural systems. 
They're important partners too. We need to find creative ways to help them grow crops while using less water. That takes money and know-how. But farmers have shown they're willing to work together as long as society chips in to help cover the costs and the projects strengthen rather than threaten their livelihoods. Farmers must remain an essential partner in any meaningful long-term solution. I've spent more than 20 years working to change water law, to better protect rivers, streams, and the Great Salt Lake. My first efforts took four years, hundreds of conversations, just to crack open the door the tiniest bit. 14 years later, the Utah legislature fully opened that door passing with overwhelming support, a bill that transformed our ability to keep more water in nature. The sponsor of that bill, a fifth generation Utah farmer and rancher. As that illustrates, Great Salt Lake has become a proving ground for ideas that bring people together in powerful and transformative ways. Today, we must magnify that cooperation tenfold. Urban, suburban, rural interests, liberals and conservatives, faith communities and committed atheists, all of us working together to sustain the lake that sustains us. There's an old saying in the West that whiskey's for drinking, water's for fighting. But the truth is, the story of water is a story of cooperation. After all, the pioneers had to work together to build thriving communities in the desert. And indeed, even the elaborate system of dams and canals that today contribute to the lake's declines reflect a cooperative effort on, the, on a grand scale to harness water to meet the needs of a growing nation. Today, we must channel that same spirit to build a newer, smarter infrastructure to save Great Salt Lake, which early Utah settler Wilfred Woodruff called one of the wonders of the world. The distance from where we stand to saving the lake can feel immense, like an impossibly high mountain we've only just begun to climb. But I take comfort in the words of Pulitzer Prize winning author Wallace Stegner. It's hard to be pessimistic about the West, he wrote. This is the native home of hope. The second part of that quote though less well known, is no less profound. When the West fully learns that cooperation, not rugged individualism, is the quality that most characterizes and preserves it, then it has a chance to create a society to match its scenery. Will you join me in that effort? Together, we can build a community worthy of this place we call home. Thank you.